It's Earth Day, and we've got correspondents around the world reporting some of the stories that are important to us about the health of our planet. Vladimir Dutier, the man who'd be sitting in this very chair right now, is in Brazil. He spent three days doing a deep dive into the world's largest jungle. He's with scientists trying to understand the effects of cutting down so many trees. A trip to the Amazon is no simple journey, nor one lightly taken. Damn, this box. It usually involves multiple flights on planes that get noticeably smaller as the regions get more remote. After another hour in the back of a truck, we're finally here. Tanguru Ranch. This 200,000 acre industrial farm may not be what you imagine as the Amazon, but it sits right up against these massive walls of dense rainforest. In essence, it's the last line of civilization and the front line in the battle against deforestation. For us, this is a perfect laboratory to work. It's a very large farm. It's half forest and half farmland. So we're, we're able to set up different experiments in both farmland and forest to see what the differences are. Mike Coe is a soldier in that battle. As the head of the Woods Hole Research Center science station based here at the ranch, his weapons are data. If you cut down the forest, you're just adding to global warming. You're doing it by increasing the amount of carbon that goes in the atmosphere, and you're doing it by just heating up the surface. Since the rise of large-scale industrial farming here in the past 50 years, scientists like Co estimate that almost 20% of the original Amazon has been deforested, cut down to make way for agriculture. <coughs> to measure the impact of all those lost trees, you you've got to get above it all. So this tower uh, allows us to measure how forests are breathing in and out. And that's where scientist Paolo Brando works. First thing you notice, when you're 130 feet above the Amazon is how breathtaking the view is from up here. But for scientists, it is not about the view. It's about the science. That tree is probably three or four tons of carbon that is storing. So they assimilated carbon that otherwise would be in the atmosphere. What happens if these trees are cut down and that carbon is released into the atmosphere? This carbon goes into the atmosphere and contribute to heat trapping uh, in the atmosphere. There's as much carbon captured and stored in all the trees of the Amazon as the amount the entire planet has emitted over the past 10 years. Cut them down, and we effectively double the heat trapping gases of the past decade. But the trees are more than just carbon containers. In some regions of the Amazon, about 30% of the rain depends on the trees. In some parts of the Amazon, it rains because of the trees. Yes, because of the trees. They're a key part of the global weather cycle. They soak up water from the soil, it evaporates off the treetops, and creates the life-giving rain that supports millions of people downwind. I prefer to call it the air conditioner of the Earth, because all that water rains out somewhere else. You know, so without that recycling of water, you've got a lot less rain, you've got a lot hotter planet. Coe's data shows that with less trees, the dry season around here has expanded by three and a half weeks in the past 50 years. The problem is, it's not being reforested. Each year there's more being taken out and there's none being replaced. So that's actually the problem. Co and his team may have discovered a solution by relying on the jungle's original inhabitants. Using field data and these remote cameras, the Woods Hole team has learned that large mammals actually are the best fertilizers. They are great at eating seeds and then dropping them somewhere else. Tracking those seeds because those seeds when they hit the ground lead to reforestation. Right. These animals are playing a big role in getting new trees to grow. Also playing a big role, indigenous human populations who live in the area. With generations of climate knowledge over a huge swath of territory, they're the people most immediately affected by recent droughts and previously unheard of forest fires. His grandfather recognized that there were changes happening. Things were changing here and there would be a pressure squeezing them, squeezing them. And they might also have some of the answers. It's going to be really important to engage indigenous people in this whole discussion of how can we make a landscape that works for everyone. How about that? Vlad joins us now from a forest just outside Brazil's capital city, Brasilia. My man, you took us to school right there. That was interesting. David, it was one of the most fascinating stories I've ever covered uh, to understand the science that protects the equilibrium, the equilibrium of this very beautiful landscape and how it affects the entire planet was really, truly breathtaking. And we had an incredible team of scientists 
doctors uh, and helpers who helped us to understand that. And then you saw at the end of the piece when we went into that indigenous community and what the scientists are doing, they're going and talking to these indigenous folks to understand ancient and traditional ways that they've been able to maintain that delicate balance between man and the use of the forest. And we're also, and they're able to show them some modern scientific applications that they can help them as well. But uh, it really was a remarkable experience. So add to some of your reporting in the piece, what's the one thing that you included in your story that you want to elaborate on? So did you realize you have covered uh, the wildfires that have raged across the United States uh, over the past couple of years. And I didn't realize that many trees that are in force generally have some kind of genetic protection against forest fires because they are susceptible to forest fires. In the Amazon, for decades and decades and decades, there were no forest fires. Why? Because it's a rainforest. And so it was always semi-wet. In the last couple of years, they started to see forest fires in the Amazon. And get this, David, the danger is that those trees have no, they have not evolved to protect themselves against forest fires. And so that is something that is new. So those trees burn down. And now you've disrupted that delicate balance within the rainforest, which means agriculture is disrupted, which means wildlife is disrupted. And ultimately, it means humans are disrupted. You know, Vlad, this story, what, what, what I love about the experience of watching you there and hearing this, it, it just, it gives us an appreciation in terms of an example, right? It's not just climate change and, and what we hear. This is like a, a, we saw it. You know, it makes sense that the animals they eat, they drop, that leads to more trees, right? I mean, that, that, it just, it makes sense. I feel like this, impo this reporting is so, is so important to our conversation right now about climate change. It certainly is. And you know, the other thing, David, is, um, a lot of the things that we were shown in the rainforest are things that you and I learned when we were in fifth grade science class, right? We understood that uh, sunlight provides food to the trees. The trees convert that sunlight into carbohydrates. Uh, that is food for themselves. They then grow. It rains. That rain makes its way to the canopy of the trees, down to the uh, bottom of the roots of those trees. The trees suck up the rainwater. The rain is then dispersed through the leaves back into the atmosphere and the cycle starts all over again. That pattern, this rainforest being the largest rainforest on planet Earth is not only instrumental to the survival of people here in South America, it's instrumental to the survival of the entire human race because what happens here can have direct effects on weather patterns uh, straight across to where you are in New York and in the United States. My man, this is why we call reporting a public service. Thank you, and happy Earth Day, buddy. Thank you, David.